Good morning, guys. Let's stand up and worship this morning.
this place, fill this place. Would you just take a minute and just invite the Holy Spirit into your hearts right now? He's in this place, He is amongst us, but would you just, just welcome Him here? Amen. That is the word of the Lord. This morning we're gonna we're gonna do a new song, and as our sister in Christ just said, that uh, the Lord is with you. Yes. He is. He is near you. He is close to you. Yes. He wants to be present in your life, and the, this next song. Like I said, it's, it's brand new. We're going to teach it to you this morning. If you already know it, then great. Go ahead and, and, and worship with us. Um, if not, that's okay. What I'm going to ask you to do this morning is to make room for the Lord. And that's literally what the song is called. It's what it's, it's talking about, to make room for Him, to make room for the Holy Spirit. And to just surrender. And as Pastor Scott was saying last week, you know, we read through Romans 12, saying, uh, do not conform to this world, but be transformed. And we have, there has to be a, a, a lifestyle change, right? Once, now that we're walking with Christ, there's a change, there's a difference in walking with him. And we gotta sacrifice some things, right? That's the hard thing. We gotta sacrifice our sin nature. We gotta sacrifice that those fleshly desires. We gotta give those things up. That's kind of the bad news. But the good news is, is that following Jesus is, is easy, it's simple. He just wants you to believe that he died for your sins. He wants you to believe that he rose from the grave. He doesn't expect perfection. He just expects obedience. That's all he wants. He just wants your love. He just wants your worship. And so as we sing this new song, for those of you struggling in this moment of just wondering where your, 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 your place is, wondering, wondering where your, your faith is even at this moment, a good first step to take is to bring your body to the altar and to worship as we teach you this new song. So if you're comfortable, would you come forward and let's worship, all right?
It doesn't matter. I don't want to lose the wonder of your presence. And I don't want to come entitled. Just want to run it like a child. Caught up in the joy and wonder of your presence. Now I'm coming back to first. Coming back to Jesus, coming back to you. And no more going through the motions. You're my one devotion. I'm coming back to you.
Nothing matters more to me. Nothing. Sing that out. together right now, Lord, and we just pray. Maybe somebody came in this church building today, Lord, and they didn't know where they were at with God. Maybe they didn't know where to step. Maybe they didn't know where to go. And this song, Lord, may have touched them in a way where it's time to come back to God. It's time to come back to Jesus. They've been running for far too long. And Jesus, we lay ourselves down at your feet and we say, Lord, you're all we need. There's nothing that matters in our life. Lord God, I pray that each and every single person in this place today puts you first in everything we do. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Can we give God praise this morning? Thank you, Jesus. While we're showing our appreciation, let's also show appreciation to this worship team. Thank you guys so much for leading us in worship this morning. You guys may be seated. I already see you're sitting down. (laughs) The lights are so bright, sometimes I I can't tell. Good morning, Cornerstone. My name is Pastor Matthew. I'm the family pastor here. I am so excited you guys are here this morning. How many of you are excited that you woke up and came to church? Amen? I am. I am. Hey, just a couple of announcements, and uh, we have a really full schedule today, and we're really excited. We're going to hear uh, from some missionaries later, Eric and Kimberly Duke, which I'm really excited uh, for. Uh, May 7th is our worship night. Please mark that on your calendars. It's at 6 p.m. We are doing baptisms. So if you look in your bulletin, you will see that there is a, uh, uh, an insert where you can sign up. Put that in the offering uh, while we collect offering here in just one minute. Um, we do want to pray with you guys today. I know that normally we, we pray during our worship, but we will be reserving prayer and prayer needs after uh, Pastor Scott's sermon. So we didn't forget about it. We do want to meet you guys where you're at and your needs today. Uh, last week, Pastor Scott um, challenged us to step up in the church, right, and serve and get involved here at Cornerstone. And we still have a booth in the back. It's just not to the left 
of me. It's to the right of me this time. So there are some tests back there, spiritual giftings tests, if you didn't get one last week. Or it, maybe you forgot to fill it out, which I get. I understand we're busy all week. If you forgot to fill out your form but you still want to serve, make sure you go back there, fill it out. Let us get in contact with you. Amen. Let's have, uh, let's have the ushers come up as we get ready for our tithe and our offering. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Matthew. Wow, that was really a great report. I love that hat. That's a sweet hat. Pastor Robert, I can see you wearing one of those hats. That is, yeah, that's cool. Hey, this morning we are in Romans chapter 12 again. Could you take your Bible out? We're talking about how to love people that are weird. Actually, we're talking about uh, loving people in, in the church, church people. Sometimes church people are strange. Sometimes they're a little bit off. I've been in ministry, a pastor, for uh, over 30 years, and I've seen a lot of great people in my life at church. I've seen a lot of wonderful people who were very loving to me uh, and my family. Um, I've also experienced people who were kind of mean and rude and nasty in our lives as well as a pastor. Um, I, I can recall one particular incident when I was in Lancaster as a children's pastor. I don't know if you've ever been to Lancaster, California before, but it gets hot in the summer. Uh, this particular Sunday was 120 degrees. I decided I was going to wear shorts as a children's pastor. Well, somebody didn't like that, that I wore shorts. And after the service was over, uh, she targeted me and told me what for and basically said that I was going to hell because I wore shorts to church. I think it's really interesting. It's easy to love people that love us, right? Isn't that true? It's easy to love people that love you. It's hard to love people that, that aren't so loving, uh, people that don't love us. In Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, if you look at that, it's, it's quite a few verses, but it's divided into two sections. The first half, actually, the, the 9 through 16, deals with how we are to love believers, how we're to love believers. People in the church. The second half, verses 17 through 21, describes how we're to love unbelievers, particularly people who oppose us, people who are our enemies. So let's look at this together, and I'm going to go very quickly through it. There's some sermon notes in your bulletin. Uh, I, the fill in the blanks will be up on the screen here in just a moment. But, but let's look at this. How to love people. How to love people within the church. The first one is this. Don't pretend to love. Don't pretend to love. That comes from verse number 9. Paul says this, and I'm using, I like uh, to use the, 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 the Living Bible, okay? So I'm going to use the Living Bible today. So it might be a little bit different than your Bible. I will actually switch over to the New American Standard Bible in just a few moments. But let's look at this together. It says, don't just pretend that you love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, stand on the side of good. In the New American Standard, it says, love is without hypocrisy. That means don't be fake when you're showing love. Have you ever heard a Christian say, and maybe you've said this, I don't really like that person, but I love them in the Lord. I love them in the Lord. I don't know how that can happen when we separate our human feelings from our spiritual feelings, but basically when someone's saying, when someone says that, they're saying, I hate their stinking guts. Paul says this, love is love. Really love them. Don't pretend to love them. Genuine love doesn't mean that you don't take a stand against something that is wrong. Paul says this, true love means sometimes you have to take a stand against something. He says, hate what is wrong, right? Stand on the side of good. When another believer does something that is wrong, when another believer is, is sinful uh, or they're acting in an evil way, a sinful act, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to see that and we're, we have to understand that evil hurts people. We love the person, but we hate the evil. 
Paul follows the negative with a positive, and he says, stand on the side of good. Another version says, cling to what is good. Another translation says, be wedded to what is good. We ought to spend so much time doing good that we don't have time to do what is bad. The point is is that we must reject sin without rejecting the person, without rejecting people. Here at Cornerstone, our goal is not to be fake. We don't want to pretend to love you. We want to genuinely love people, really love each other. And sometimes when we love each other, it means that we've got to confront sin, right? Because we genuinely care about you. We genuinely care about people. And so when we see someone that is caught in sin, when we see a believer that has stumbled or is involved in some kind of sin, we confront it. If you choose to confront someone in sin who is a believer, per- perhaps even in this church, let me give you some words of wisdom. If you are aware of someone who is caught in sin, address them in love. And don't do it in front of somebody else. Don't do it in front of people. Do it in secret. When you confront someone, do it in love. Don't be condemning. Be helpful with your words. Help them. Show them grace. Don't share. Once you know information about somebody, don't share it with other people. Don't gossip about that person, about their struggles, about their issues. Show that person genuine love. Here's number two, love like family. Love like family. Some of you might think, well, I don't even love my family. Well, you're supposed to love your family, okay? Love like family. Verse number 10, love each other with brotherly affection and take delight in honoring each other. Love the believer like you would your own family. Paul's talking here about being tender. He's talking about being affectionate in your love. Friends, we as believers should be affectionate toward each other as believers, as, bo- as the body of Christ. Some people say, you know what? I-, I-, I think you guys do a lot of hugging here at Cornerstone. Some of you are like, I'm so glad that you hug here because I don't ever get hugs anywhere else. I look forward to coming to church. I look forward to the hugs that, that Susan Hagman will give me or Robert Hagman or somebody at the door. We, we like to hug people. If you don't like a hug, all you have to do is put your hands up like this, all right? I had somebody do that the other day to me. Uh, I w- went to hug them and they're like, mm-mm. I said, oh, you're COVID conscious? And she says, no, I just don't want to hug you. All right. It says, Paul says, and take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in honoring each other. What does that mean? It basically means give people credit. Give people credit. Talk about something good that someone is doing. Compliment them. Compliment people. When you're talking about people, instead of gossiping about them, instead of finding some fault in them and talking about that, try talking about something good that someone is doing. I'm still talking about how wonderful Dee Dee Dutra did at the spring concert with her team and all those that helped with that. I'm still talking about Judy and David when they come here on Sunday morning before anybody else and they do the backs of the chairs. Guys, it's important that we talk about and appreciate people in a good way. Give people credit. Here's number three. Love with excitement. Love with excitement. Verse number 11, never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. How many of you know that we should get excited about serving the Lord? I love this campaign that we're on about serving the Lord and finding our gifts, our spiritual gifts, and finding a place in the body of Christ. Friends, we are not to serve the Lord in a crabby way. We're not to come here and, and serve the Lord, you know, and, and greet people in a, in, a, in a crabby way. We're to love them enthusiastically. Some versions say never be lacking in zeal. How do you get that zeal? You fill your life with love. Friends, the most love, unloving people are also the most unenthusiastic people. The church has a lot of 
the church that has a lot of love is an enthusiastic kind of a church. I think Cornerstone is an enthusiastic church, don't you? I think we love on purpose. I think we're excited to serve the Lord. And I think because of that, we, people are drawn to that. I like to be around people that are enthusiastic, don't you? I like to be around people that, that love to serve the Lord, that are excited to serve the Lord. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Here's number four, and we're going quickly through this. Be happy about the future and persevere in prayer. Be happy about the future and persevere in prayer. Verse 12 says, be glad for all God is planning for you. Be patient in trouble and prayerful always. I look at that verse and there's a lot to it, so I broke it down for you. It's very simple, but I want you to understand this. In the context of loving people, what Paul's talking about here, he basically says three things. First of all, number one, don't be a downer. Don't be a downer. Saturday Night Live, I think that Debbie Downer, how many have ever heard her before? Debbie, don't be a Debbie Downer, okay? Paul says be joyful in hope. You know, there's so much to be negative about. We can talk about negative things all day long. But the important thing is, is that people need people who are going to be positive around them. We hear so much negativity all the time. As a believer, as a Christian, we should be someone who presents our words in a way that they are filled with hope. That doesn't mean that we stick our heads in the sand and pretend that nothing is wrong. We just choose to focus in on the good things that God has in store for us. Friends, you might have an illness. You might have an issue in your life, something going on. You don't need anybody to come alongside of you and tell you how terrible it is. I mean, isn't that terrible when, when you're going through someone and they have to offer their advice and it's usually like a negative kind of thing? Like, I remember when I had that sickness and I was out for five weeks. And it's like, you don't need that. You need people around you who are filled with hope who would say, you know, you're going to make it. You're going to do it. You can stand and be strong. We need people like that. We don't need that kind of negativity. Here's the second thing that we see in that verse. Be resilient. Be resilient. All of us in this room, we go through stuff. We go through problems and issues and things are hard. Paul is saying, I realize things are hard, but be patient. Write it out. Write it out. Be resilient. Persevere. It's not on the screen, but Romans 5, 3 through 5 says this. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our tribulation. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. What does all that mean? It means that the crud that we're going through, it produces something in us. God uses the problems in our life, the issues in our life, to produce something wonderful. And Paul is just emphasizing here, stick with it. Just, just write it out because God is molding you. God's shaping you in this issue, whatever you're going through. Here's the third thing out of that verse. Be prayerful. Be prayerful. When that pressure comes from life, so many times we forget to pray, don't we? The pressures of life, the issues of life, they hang over us. And instead of going to the Lord in prayer, we get kind of weird and crabby with people. And it's just like we're irritable and we get mean and we get rude with other people. And it's easy to snap at somebody. Maybe you snapped at somebody recently because of your issue that you've got. It's not that you're really mad at the person that, that is in front of you. You just got issues in your life, right? Maybe you, 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 somebody looked at you wrong or got ticked off. You got ticked off because they, they did something in the parking lot. But really, there's deep issues that are going on in your life. I like to use the pressure cooker every once in a while at my house. Uh, a couple nights ago, we, we, we made uh, mac and cheese. How many have ever made mac and cheese in a pressure cooker? It's super good. 
But the thing of it is, is once you put that lid on really tight, make sure that there's no air or no steam that can come out of it. When it's done, you can't just pop the lid open, right? Because it's going to blow up in your face. You gotta let it out, let the steam out slowly. And that's what prayer is all about. If you're not releasing your burdens to the Lord on a regular basis, then there's something that's gonna happen to you throughout your day or throughout your week. It's like, you know, you're gonna blow up at somebody, right? And it'll probably be somebody that you really love and care about. That's why God says, put your burden on me. This is a daily thing that we should be doing, guys, releasing our worries, releasing our anxiety, bringing it to the Lord in prayer. Here's number five. Take the initiative to be hospitable. Hospitable. How many of you consider yourself to have the gift of hospitality? Let me see your hands. Some of you are like, I'm not raising my hands. He's going to ask me to do something. (laughs) You're like... (laughs) I know some of you do have the gift of hospitality. Verse number 13, it says, When God's children are in need, you be the one to help them out and get into the habit of inviting guests home for dinner or if they need lodging for the night. Wow, that is so like in your face right there. It's so practical. I think if we were to take a poll this morning, most of us would say, you know what, I like helping people. I think most of us would probably say they like helping people. But let's think about this for a minute, okay, in helping others. Without telling me, don't yell it out, think in your head, when was the last time you helped someone? Don't tell me. Don't tell your, just think about it in your head. Maybe you have recently. Maybe you helped somebody. Maybe you went and picked somebody up for church or took them home. Or maybe you went uh, and took somebody to lunch or you brought them dinner. Uh, Maybe you helped somebody with a project at their house. You, You helped someone, right? We all have good intentions, but I think the main reason why we do not show more hospitality within the church is because why? Why do you think? We say it all the time. I'm busy, right? We are so busy that we hardly ever show hospitality. And it doesn't mean that we don't show hospitality. It's just that the Lord really wants us to be aware and to show it on a regular basis. But we say we don't have time. But whenever you give your time to somebody, that is showing hospitality. It also says to get into the habit of inviting guests over for dinner or if they need a place to stay for the night, have them stay with you. I won't ask you to raise your hand when the last time you made dinner for someone. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Or when the last time you invited someone that was in need to spend the night. And I'm talking about the body of Christ. I'm talking about church. I'm talking about people that are believers. But really, when was the last time? Think about it. When was the last time you invited someone? Well, my house, if you saw my house, it's a wreck. It's a mess. It needs to be remodeled. I don't want anybody using our restroom. You know, it's, we've got excuses. I'm still waiting for a lot of you to invite me over, but I know how it is. And you're probably waiting for me to invite you over to my house. I think a lot of us, we tend to just go out to eat, right? Let's go out to eat instead. But there's something about going in the home, right? And I think that's why the life groups are so important as well, because we get into the home and we share meals together. It's really cool to see that gift of hospitality in in a lot of people in our church here. Um, The next next one, number six, uh, never speak evil or negative of another believer. Never speak evil or negative of another believer. It says in verse 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless them and don't curse them. I hate to say it, and you you know it, but Christians hurt other Christians. And some of you have been the recipient of hurt. Maybe 
from another church, maybe even in this church, somebody's hurt you. Maybe you have experienced hurt pretty deeply from someone within a church, maybe a church leader. How do you deal with all of that? How do you deal with that hurt? How do you deal with the past going forward, going to church? Now, a lot of Christians, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are some Christians who have been hurt by other Christians or hurt by church leaders that have actually put all of that on God and said, fine, I'm not going to even go to church anymore and really hang up the towel, right? I think that it's so important that if you are a hurting Christian, you've been hurt by other Christians, there is help. There's a fantastic book, and I want you to write it down. It's, it's, it's a pretty old book, but it's called Crucified by Christians. Anybody ever heard of it, heard of it before? Crucified by Christians. It's by Gene Edwards. It's a fantastic book. It deals with how to deal with people like that and why uh, people have hurt you and to how to receive healing from the Lord. But if you are in that situation, there is help for you. Even though we are believers in Christ, we are all capable of hurting people and capable of being hurt. When you're hurt by someone because of what they say to you or because of what they don't say to you, and a lot of us, we have expectations of other people. We have expectations of church leaders of they should be doing this or they should say this and we tend to get our feelings hurt. We get offended so easy. But listen, it, Paul is saying be careful. Be careful when you are offended not to talk badly about them. And I know it's hard because that's our tendency. We want to talk about how bad they are, what they did, what they didn't do. We want people to know our pain. That's why we talk about it. That's why we gossip. We want justice. They hurt me, so I want to figure out a Christian way <laughs> to hurt them back. Now listen, I'm not talking about abuse here. Okay, so take that off the plate. If someone has abused you in your past within the church, perhaps a church leader, that is a totally different story. If you have been abused you got to bring that before the authorities and that has to be dealt with. What we're talking about here is stuff where people hurt your feelings or people talk behind your back or people that make accusations about you or your family. When somebody ridicules you and puts you down, the Bible tells us that we are not supposed to talk evil about them. We're not supposed to talk negative about them. We are supposed to talk well of them. It doesn't make sense in our world, in our culture. That's not what people do. But in the church, as believers, we're called to a different standard. Amen? This is following the teachings of Jesus. Paul is outlining here, and he's saying that you can choose your response you can choose your response to me, but I choose my response to you. I can't control what you say about me, but I can control what I say about you. Right? That's what God will hold us accountable for. Number seven, be sensitive to each other's feelings. Be sensitive to each other's feelings. When others are happy, it says in verse 15, when others are happy, be happy with them. If they are sad, share their sorrow. Another version says it this way, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. It sounds like a very sweet and easy thing to do, right? You're happy, I'll be happy with you. You're sad, I'll be sad with you. Don't you think, it, don't you think it's easier to be sad with somebody who's sad? Think about it. If someone's going through something difficult, it's easier to be sad with somebody who's sad than to be happy with somebody who is happy. Not always, but think about it in this way. When someone that you know in church gets a promotion or they get a really good job and they share with you and you are struggling because you don't have a job, it's hard to be happy with them, right? 
Or when someone just bought a new car and you got a piece of junk and it's like, it's hard to be happy with someone when they're driving up with this brand new car. It's like, what's the deal? Guys, this is something we all need to work on, right? And not, and not be fake about it. Number eight, avoid pride and partiality. Avoid pride and partiality. Verse 16, work happily together. Don't try to act big. Don't try to get into the good graces of important people, but enjoy the company of ordinary folks. As a believer... We should know and understand that we are one in Christ. We are one. None of us are more important than the other. We talked about that last week. We might be at different levels as far as economically uh, and our age or educationally, but really we are all on the same page. We are one in Christ, one in the body of Christ. And Paul says, treat everyone with respect. Everyone with the same kind of respect. There should be no partiality within the church. Don't think that you are too good for some people in the church. Live in harmony with each other. In James chapter 2, it, uh, the author talks about a story of a rich man who comes into church. And the usher sees the rich man and ushers him right up to the front row. And then a few minutes later, a poor man comes in, a beggar comes in, and they're not ushered into the same area. They're ushered to the back of the church. Paul is saying, don't do that. Don't show partiality. Paul tells us to enjoy the company of ordinary folks. Learn to get along with people that don't necessarily look like you. By doing so, you might just find your next best friend. Amen? In the next couple of verses, we're switching now. We're going pretty quickly because time's getting away from us. Paul now switches to dealing with unbelievers. That's this next section right here. In verse 17 and the following, he uses the word everybody. And everyone in verse 18. He uses the word enemy in verse 20. So now he's not just talking about the family of God, but how do you relate to everyone? How do you relate to everyone? Looking real quickly, and I'm going to read this portion of Scripture out of the New American Standard Version. It says it this way on the screen. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This next section here on your sermon notes is how to respond when you have been mistreated. First of all, um, these are four practical examples. Let me give you four practical examples as we go through this quickly. Control your automatic responses. Control your automatic responses. We tend to uh, just be automatic. When somebody does something to us, there's an automatic response that has been created in us. Uh, it's kind of a natural response that we have when someone hurts our feelings. I heard a funny story about some officers during the Korean War who rented a house for themselves. They had hired a Korean houseboy to work for them. He was a cheerful, happy soul, and they were young, these officers, and they had a lot of fun playing tricks on him. They would nail his shoes to the floor. They would put water, a bucket of water, over the door. When he would walk in, the bucket of water would fall on his head. They played all kinds of tricks on him, but he was always so kind, and he never retaliated back. They finally came to the point where they were ashamed of themselves, and they felt really sorry, so they called him in, and they said, We've been doing all these mean things to you and you've taken it so beautifully. We want to apologize to you and tell you that we're never going to do those mean things to you again. The young Korean boy said, you mean no more nail shoes to floor? You mean no more water on door? No, no more. 
He said, okay, then no more spit in soup. <laughs> the moral of this story is that it is possible to take silent revenge. No, it isn't. That's not what the Bible says. Don't do, don't do that. Do not, the, Paul says, don't repay evil for evil, right? Here's number two. Imagine yourself in their position. Imagine yourself in there. When somebody hurts you, and people have hurt us really bad, people are doing things for a reason. They have things going on. Maybe you don't realize it, but try to imagine their life. Take a moment. Think about where they have come from. Imagine their background. Imagine their parents. Imagine whatever you need to, but put yourself in their position. Imagine them uh, in their, in their, when they were growing up, what kinds of things they might have gone through. And remember this, that hurt people hurt people. Always remember that. I've always got to remember that. When somebody hurts me, it's like, oh, I'm going to tear your head off. It's like, no, they're, they're hurting. Hurt people hurt people. That'll help us so much to realize that. Verse 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Aren't you so glad that Paul put that in there? I am. As far as it depends on you. There are some people out there, and I have experienced that, and probably you have too, that you just can't win, that you just can't be at peace with. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with them, right? Number three, surrender all revenge to the Lord. And we're coming to a close, guys. This is it. Surrender all revenge to the Lord. As much as you want to take revenge in your own hands, as much as you want to slash their tires, as much as you want to do something really mean back to them, God says, let me have the revenge. It's mine. It doesn't belong to you. Before, when you weren't a Christian, you acted a different way. But now that you are a Christian, revenge doesn't belong to you anymore. The Bible says that God will repay. Look at the verse on the screen. Never take your own revenge, beloved but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The last one is this, make your enemy your friend. There are people who are like, well, they're an enemy for a reason. I'm not, I want to make them my friend. Well, here's what happens. It says here in verse 20, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will reap or you will heap burning coals on his head. Wow. Does that mean like when I do those things, when I feed him when he's hungry and give him something to drink when he's thirsty? That basically means when he's in need, I'm providing for him. And when I do that, is it like hurting him? Like I'm going to put burning coals on that freak's head. Is that what that means? No. It basically means when you are doing something good for your enemy, someone that doesn't like you, someone that hurts you, it allows, when you do those good things to them, it allows the conviction of the Holy Spirit to be on that person. In other words, you're not hurting them by putting burning coals on their head. You're allowing God to deal with them. You just do what God tells you to do. You give to them if they're in need. Well, you don't know what they did to me. The Bible says you do it. You give. If you see them in need, you be the provider for it. And in doing so, you will bring the conviction of the Holy Spirit so strong upon that person that they might just turn and they might just end up being your best friend. I love as we close, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good.
Would you stand to your feet and let's close. I said a lot. There's a lot there. You can take the time to read the scriptures yourself. This is probably one of the most practical scriptures for Christians there is. Let's just not be hearers of God's word today. But let's do it. Right? It's hard. But God has called us to a life of action. Let's do what God's word says. If you need prayer today, we're going to invite some of our staff, some of those that are on our prayer team to come up here and we'll pray for you at the end. But let me pray a prayer over you and we will be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word. Although it's hard some, some of this to read and to understand because it's so contrary to what our feelings are. But God, you have called us to overcome our feelings. You've called us to walk in truth and to walk in your ways. We want to be just like you, Jesus. We want to act like you. We want to talk like you. We want to respond to you, especially when people hurt us. May your peace fall upon us in a fresh new way. May we understand truly the cost of being a disciple, the cost of being a Christian. Bless each one in this room. Thank you also for our missionaries today that are so diligent in, in raising support and going to a land that so desperately needs you. Continue to equip them and continue to provide for them. We just ask your blessing, God, as we leave this room in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. Again, if you need prayer, would you come forward?